All right, so we will go ahead and get started. If folks want to take a seat, uh, and as always, we do about a two-minute uh, whip around the room with introductions, so you know who is here. And uh, usually, if I stand up here talking long enough, it starts to quiet down so people can hear each other. Sometimes I have to resort to serious measures. Never tried singing, but that could be a strategy. So, okay, my friends, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we will begin with introductions. Uh, just a quick whip around. I know there's a lot of folks, but believe it or not, we can do it in about four minutes. Uh, if you just say who you are and where you're from, that proves to be one of the most important parts of the, uh, the afternoon. My name is Bill Fulton with the Civic Canopy. I've been assisting with the facilitation of this great process, and I will uh, pass it over here to Charlotte. Just real quickly, who you are and who you're with. Good afternoon, I'm Charlotte Brantley with Clayton Early Learning. I'm Jeannie Vandenberg, a contract lobbyist for a variety of uh, education organizations. Gabby Reed, House Majority Author. Kayla McGannon, Stanford Children, Colorado. Chris Watney, I'm the president of the Colorado Children's Campaign and also a co-chair of the um, School Finance Partnership. Gladys Wilson, Star, Colorado. Paul McCarty, Hanover School District. Amy Redfern, lobbyist for the Pikes Peak Area School District Alliance. Cheryl Sperano, Superintendent, Mount Fort Carson. Walt Cooper, Superintendent, Cheyenne Mountain. Tom Coyne, State Advisory Committee for Gifted Ed. Rick Walter, Superintendent, Miami Yoder. Catherine Hammerbeck, Early Childhood Education Association. Julie Pellegrin, Office of Legislative Legal Services. Hi, Brita Darling, Legislative Legal Services. Uh, Josh Abram, Legislative Council Staff. <coughs> Nicole Myers, Office of Legislative Legal Services. Pat Sanchez, Adams 14 School District. Mary Wickersham, Teton Foundation. Eileen Piper with the Denver Preschool Program. Mark Ryberg, Summit Schools. Ann Clement, K-12 Online. Dear Ram Dong, JLH Public Affairs. Patrick Kiki, Superintendent, Estes Park School District. Christina Medina, Colorado Association for Bilingual Ed. George Walsh, Center Schools. Mike Warren, Superintendent, Otis. Rudy Andrus, RBC Capital Markets. Mike Johnston, State Senate, Northeast Denver. Glenn Gustafson, Colorado Springs, District 11. Peg LaPlante, Charter School Institute. <laughs> Frank Walters, the Bell Policy Center. Lucinda Hundley, Director of Consortium of Special Education Directors. It would help if I could talk. Diane Doney, Littleton Public Schools. Lori Gillis, Jeffco Schools. Lori Dugan, Jeffco Schools. Dan O'Connell, Colorado Children's Campaign. Mike Griffith, Education Commission of the States. Emily Workman, Education Commission of the States. Susie DeYoung, Brighton Public Schools. Ann Hatman, Brighton School District. Nate Gola, Colorado Education Association. Nan Vindania, Colorado Department of Education. Good afternoon, Jennifer Landrum, Colorado Children's Campaign. Heather Trayton, Qualistar, Colorado. Melissa Colesman, Colorado Department of Education. Bobby Watson, Early Childhood Council of Boulder County. Sharon Triolo Maloney, Colorado Department of Education. Hannah Nichols, the Colorado Children's Campaign. Uh, Eric Bree, Office of uh, Senator Mike Johnson. Damien Leotali, Office of Senator Mike Johnson. Jeanette Salazar hanging in the corner with the Office of Mike Johnson. <laughs> Dan Hunicky, Cherry Creek Schools. Guy Belleville, Cherry Creek Schools. Bruce Atchison, Early Learning Partnerships. Craig Harper, Joint Budget Committee Staff. Anna Jo Haynes, Early Childhood Leadership Commission. Elaine 
Ann Gann, Sperman State Board of Ed. Scott Myers, Littleton Public Schools. Kathy Gephardt, Children's Voices. Tracy Rainey, Colorado School Finance Project. Renee Howell, Colorado School Finance Project. Riley Thayro, Colorado Children's Campaign. I'm Carol Hedges with the Colorado Fiscal Institute. Cara Beach with the Colorado Forum. Ben DeGro, Independence Institute. Bill Jager, Stanford Children. Kristen Weisinger, Rocky Mountain Children's Law Center. Vinny Badalato, Colorado League of Charter Schools. Yolan Shin, Don O'Kay Foundation. Pamela Harris, Smile High Montessori Early Learning Centers. Jen Walmer, Denver Public Schools. Scott Smith, Denver Public Schools. David Hart, DPS. Jeremiah Johnson, Denver Public Schools. Leanne M, Colorado Department of Ed. Todd Harry, Legislative Council Staff. Amber Elias, Denver Public Schools. Mary Lynn Crystal, School Finance, Department of Education. Raleigh Heath State Center for Boulder. Bruce Messenger, Superintendent, Boulder Valley. Jenny Belbow, Boulder Valley School Board. Tanya Kelly Bowery, Policy Matters. Ernestine Mondragon, Policy Matters. Bruce Coy, Colorado Association of School Executives, Case. Susan Scheibel, Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. Nikki Johnson, Superintendent, Campo Schools. Paula Stevenson, Colorado Rural Schools Caucus. Chris Selly, Superintendent, Custer County School District. Sue Windows, Office of Congressman Jared Polis. Dale McCall, Colorado Bosage Association. Brent Miles, Holyoke School District. Dave Montoya, Peter School District. Puffy Mendez, Mendez Consulting, representing the Coalition for Thorough and Uniform Education. You get it ready? No. Although, thank you for uh, taking care of the, <laughs> but we did miss them. Uh, uh, is there anyone else who came in? I wanted to say a quick intro. Tony, Van? <laughs> Tony Lewis says hi from the Donald K Foundation. Dan Sproles, A plus Denver and B plus Colorado. All right, well, thanks for going through that. I know it seems like it takes long. It was about six minutes, but uh, as no doubt you did, you listened for which groups are represented, who's uh, on your side of these issues as you might perceive them, who might be someone you kind of come to this space so wanting to keep an eye on. I think that's been a hallmark of this process. It's making sure the room is full of diverse perspectives. It gives us a chance to kind of hear each other's views, hopefully be transformed by those understandings and broaden all of our understanding uh, of these issues related to school finance. We've constructed this process as a way to follow up on the principles that came out of the School Finance Partnership final recommendations, uh, 18-month process, broad base of involvement. These principles we've been kind of taking off uh, one meeting at a time to move them from principle to policy recommendation, trying to wrestle through the implications, the pros and cons, the different ways to see how we might revise the uh, School Finance Act in Colorado to be ready for the 21st century. We begin each meeting with kind of a review of the past discussions uh, in what we call a soft start, just some of the takeaways, clarifications, feedback from that, and then we'll jump into the what will prove to be kind of a greatest hits meeting today. There's four different topics that we'll be actually looking at. And I know nobody really wants to talk about revenue, but we did throw that on the agenda for today as well, uh, which will. So don't leave before you get a chance to have that conversation. Uh, as we do each time, Senator Johnston, uh, looking around the room, to, uh, uh, kind of acts as our uh, spokesperson to feed back to the group some of the takeaways uh, and clarifications. I invite him back up to the front of the room to um, offer kind of a legislative perspective on the discussion from last week, Senator Johnston. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, for being here, um, especially those of you with, that are stacking up dots all over your name card. I know it's been, unfortunately, there's not an hourly rate reimbursement for all the time you've spent, but it's been incredibly well used for us. Uh, I just want to talk about two things uh, briefly from last session. Um, one, there were a number of people who weren't there at the closing of last session, and maybe me, my, may or may not have seen my post that was on the Hope Street site over the last couple of days, but I do think it's, it's worth revisiting part of the closing conversation. Um, 
And then second, I want to talk about today and then the steps ahead. So in uh, review of the last uh, session, I think there were two uh, different questions that we raised around the process of student-based allocation. Uh, and we also talked some of them, not nearly as much about the student count day, all that was on the, on the docket. And I think the two questions that were raised about uh, student-based allocation were, uh, were one, the question of, obviously I think we have an implicit agreement uh, uh, throughout this room that there are certain student characteristics that ought to uh, receive additional units of funding, which is why we have things at the state level like an at-risk factor or like uh, an ELL uh, count. And so uh, there is not necessarily disagreement yet about the notion that from the state level to the district there ought to be certain characteristics that bring certain sets of funding based on that on the child's uh, needs. The question was then about what do we do about that allocation from the district level to the school level. Uh, and I think there are two parts of that conversation that in some ways got conflated last time. Uh, one step of it is, is there a way to uh, allocate, or some might say account for, those dollars from the district to the school level? Which is, could you simply track them, or could you report, or could you monitor some way to know how those dollars that come into the district level are then allocated to individual schools? Um, the second and distinct question on the table was, once though, if those are tracked, uh, what degree of autonomy is there at the school level over how to spend those resources? Uh, and actually, you could have either one of those without the other. Right? You could have a district that gives a individual principal a tremendous amount of autonomy over spending with no actual relationship between the money that she has given and the characteristics of the students in her school. You could also envision a world in which the superintendent or her office very specifically allocates those dollars to each given school based on those characteristics, but doesn't necessarily grant the school leader in that building any autonomy over how they're spent. So I would just flag for us that they really are two separate conversations. Um, and I think different people in the room feel that different, different of those two is more important or less important, or some both important or some neither important. Um, but I think it's, it is important to come back to that those are not one conversation together. They're actually two separate parts of how we think about this question. Um, and so I think we got lots of good feedback on, on both halves of that. Um, second thing is, let me say a little bit about what was, uh, what was a little bit uh, off the track of our conversation from last week, which was, um, I was going to make a joke when I started, and I guess now I'm making it, which is, we're glad that you're all here, even if you felt like you were held hostage to be here. Um, I didn't know if that joke was too early, uh, because I think some of us, George and I included, felt like that comment was probably out of place at the last conversation, which was, uh, I, and I've said this to Marguerite, so nothing we're saying out of school, um, we did not bring Marguerite here to talk about weights and categoricals. Um, we had a separate session on that. And so uh, she opined a number of times on her belief about some weights and categoricals, including prominently the size factor. Um, and she obviously doesn't believe that's an important variable. That's a good viewpoint for us to hear. Um, and we'll take all comers. But I made the example at the end of last session that uh, this is sort of like, as an English teacher, you have a syllabus of books that are on your, that are on your caseload, or that are on your course list. Feels like a caseload sometimes in that <laughs> English teacher. Um, and you may have on that a number of books that, that are controversial or that are unique in some way for what they added to the perspective of American literature. You may have Ulysses, which no one ever actually reads or understands. Or you may have Catching the Rye, which has a bunch of swear words in it, and people don't think you can do that in a, in a uh, ninth grade English class. But it doesn't mean that, any, that the decision of any instructor to put that book on the course list means that, that that book is right in its entirety, or that the author is right in its entirety, or that the author's opinion on other topics not related to that book are right in its entirety. So I just wanted to step back for us to say, clearly, um, the, uh, one of the major issues we're going to confront today is how hard some of our rural districts have been hit by the reductions we've made in the state budget over the last couple of years. We're going to get the chance to hear from practitioners about that. Clearly, we know that the size factor is a big part of what keeps many of our rural districts afloat. Um, and clearly, we know at $250 million or so maximum, uh, even if you eliminated the size factor off the face of the earth, that is not going to save any part of the state of Colorado's fiscal problem. Right? Uh, it's not going to save any one district or any state district or any, or any state efforts. And so there is no, there is no route here to uh, sort of saving the school finance formula on the backs of rural districts. Uh, it's not, the numbers don't add up and the policy and the uh, principles don't add up. So I just wanted to be clear about the fact that uh, that was not uh, either the goal of the last session nor is it the intended outcome moving forward. Um, but I know that there were some 
Uh, there were some people who were, who were concerned. I had some good conversations the last few days with people that had uh, questions and concerns about that, so I just want to put that on the table. Um, the second part is I actually want to deviate from the whole framework I just built on the, you can have a bunch of books on the syllabus and people take them what they will. And say, uh, there is a moment where you have, to, uh, you have to pick a stance on certain issues. We have to actually put a line in the sand on what you think the things are that matter. Uh, and I've tried to be clear from the beginning, although maybe I haven't been early and often enough, that a non-negotiable for me in this process is that revenue is on the table. A non-negotiable for me is that our current school finance formula and any school finance formula that gets us to success in the 21st century at scale is going to have to require new revenue. That, for me, is a non-negotiable. And so there are many folks who were worried that uh, revenue wasn't first on the agenda or it wasn't second or it wasn't third. There was a, a reason to that rhyme, whether you agree with it or not, which is you know, I felt it was much like in macrocosm how our special ed session went two weeks ago which was it was first incredibly helpful for me, I won't speak for anyone else, to spend two or three hours learning about all of the revenue streams in special ed, what we're funding, what we're not funding, how we're underfunding them, and where the biggest holes are, before I would be asked to say, okay, if you had 200 million new dollars or 300 million new dollars, where would you put them first? And so this five session process has meant to be a macrocosm of that same structure, which is to say, let's walk through the special ed underfunding, let's walk through the weights and the categoricals, let's walk through today, early childhood and full day K, let's, walk, let's talk about the negative factor and what's missing there, and then let's then put out in front of all of us, what are all of the items on the table that we think need to be funded, and then how do we think about, among those, what our priorities become to fund them. And so this was um, uh, not last because it was least important, it was last because it was final, which is to say this is the one that allows you put all the previous priorities uh, into a category and into a, and into a list of preferences. And so I just want to say that those two things up front, which is our belief about this partnership, has been that we want to get to what does it take to build the 21st century education system for Colorado? And what are the things we need on the uh, reform or improvement side? What are the things we need on the revenue side? And uh, our belief, I think I can speak at least for, for the campaign and Chris, is that you have to do those two things together which is why I've said publicly um, that all of the reform initiatives we've discussed over the last two months and for many of us over the last year and a half, uh, I won't support separate from a reform measure, or from a revenue measure, which is to say, I think these have to go together as a package. The way they work together as a package is you get uh, the revenue you need to run a system efficiently and effectively and adequately, and then you also need the changes you would require in that system to make sure it uses the new dollars and to the highest and best use. And so, uh, our mission has always been it takes a conversation about both halves and there will be something in this conversation for everybody to dislike and hopefully something for everyone to like. Um, but that the thing that keeps us all at the table is the thing that we're most committed to liking, um, whatever that may be. And so uh, that serves both as a little bit of my looking backward onto last week and looking forward onto this week because I do think for many people uh, this has been a conversation they've been waiting to have. Uh, we wanted you to have all of the information uh, in front of you, uh, so you could have this in the most informed way. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Fulton, I think I will pause there, and if there are any questions, clarifying or otherwise, for you or for me. Yeah, yeah. Any, any other additional thoughts from last week that you wanted to add to the mix, or things to clarify? Response to Senator Johnson's jokes? Or <laughs> sure. That's why I don't tell any of them. Uh, and then obviously at the end of the session, we'll get to check in again yeah. about next steps after today, but I want to, excited about all we have to do today, so I don't want to take any more of your time. Any other points to add? All right. Um, well, we'll take that as a, um, a thoughtful reflection and uh, a way to leave more time for today's discussion. So we have a really big show, really big show today. Uh, multiple topics uh, and lots of, I think, some of the feedback we've been asking for you at the end of each session through your comment cards uh, about this balancing back and forth between best practices nationally and their application here locally, try to take that into account. And so just kind of a high level overview, um, we'll be really begin with um, a kind of a policy uh, and, and legal lens on this question, which I have to say, I, I feel like has been really enlightened to me, this negative factor, which many of you closest to the schools, I think, understand in great detail. Uh, but Todd Harriet's going to help us understand what that means. From a legislative standpoint, uh, uh, he is a member of the um, 
part of the Legislative Council. We'll then get to hear from David Hart, the CFO at uh, DPS, and George Welsh, Superintendent and Center, about how this plays out uh, in the actual level at the, uh, at the district level. Have some time for a Q&A with Todd to clarify and, and, and with our panelists, clarify the questions, what's at the heart of the matter, uh, things that you want to understand uh, about the implications of it. And uh, before the break, we'll also get to the uh, FD, or full day kindergarten and ECE funding. We've got Melissa Colesman and Van, uh, Nan Van, Van Degna, excuse me, Nan, uh, from CDE, who will kind of present that topic as well, uh, again, with Todd helping us understand that one. And then we'll take a break after that. Uh, so let me pass uh, to Todd for an introduction into the negative factor. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Will and uh, Senator Johnston's uh, staff had asked me to uh, provide a brief uh, introduction to the negative factor in the school finance formula. Um, I'm sure that's something that everybody in this room is pretty well acquainted with and uh, probably doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. So I'll give you the uh, 50,000 foot view of the negative factor as it applies to the school finance formula. You can ignore that for a second. That's just an example I'm going to try and we'll roll through in a second. Um, uh, most of you know uh, the negative factor was introduced in the School Finance Act three years ago during the 2010 legislative session. It was originally called the uh, Budget Stabilization Factor, if you'll call that. Uh, it was subsequently renamed AP uh, the following year. Um, at that time, uh, most of you know, this Colorado and all of the other states in the country were immersed in what is now uh, called the Great Recession. Um, the General Assembly was struggling with uh, difficult budget choices and decisions. And the uh, negative factor of the budget stabilization factor was one of their responses to deal with the budget issues before them. Um, the intent of it was to generate uh, savings for the state or budget relief for the state. Um, as most of you know, uh, the school finance formula uh, sets a total program funding or, or overall school funding for all of the, the districts in the state. Uh, and the money for that comes from a combination of state and local sources. Um, the negative factor was intended to reduce the state's contribution to school finance. Um, what I've put up here is just a very simplified uh, explanation of how the negative factor works before uh, it, it was introduced. And so to just give you some example uh, here, before the negative factor, if the, uh, the funding formula for all the school districts in the state set total program funding at $6 billion, let's say. And that's roughly in line with, with where we're at today. Uh, if you subtract out the local share that comes from property taxes and specific ownership taxes, the state share is the residual, the $4 billion. And before the negative factor, that tended to be sort of what the state was uh, obligated to come up with for school finance. Well, during this period of time, because of the budget situation, the legislature decided, you know, we couldn't afford $4 billion. So they introduced a negative factor, which was intended to reduce the state share or the state contribution to school finance. So um, <coughs> this is a number that the legislature has to decide every year. Um, in this particular example, I said, well, if the negative factor is $600 million, so it's 10%, say, for example, um, uh, and you reduce total program spending by $600 million, then the overall cost of total program is $5.4 billion. The local share doesn't change. What changes is the state's contribution, which is now $3.4 billion. So it was designed to generate budget savings for the state and to reduce the, state, the state's contribution. Um, in terms of how that applies for each school district in the state, um, in this particular example here, it's, it's the negative factor is 10%, and it's a, it's a reduction in every school district's total program by that proportional amount. So once the uh, funding formula decides, well, this is how much each school district gets in the state, you would cut 10% from each school district's total program, and that would come from the state share that goes to each, each school district, or from the state equalization team to go to, go to all of them. Um, 
I guess one of the things that, that did fall out of this is there's a, a great mix of, of funding sources for all of the school districts in the state. Some get a lot of money from state aid, some get very little. So although the, the, the negative factor was intended to reduce each school district's total program proportionally, there are a handful of school districts in the state, eight of them in particular, that don't get enough state aid to realize the full total program reduction. Um, a couple of other provisions were put in state law to try, try and deal with that situation, <coughs> in particular to try and reduce their uh, uh, categorical funding that they receive from the state. But it's still not enough, so there's a handful of districts that don't realize the full uh, negative factor of decision or cut in school finance. Um, the negative factor has been in place, as I mentioned, for three years. Initially, it was set at a little bit under 7% of total program. In the last two years, it's increased to just under 13%. And in the current budget year, 12-13, uh, it's at uh, a little over 16%. And so each of the school districts in the state of school is supposed to take a 16% cut in their total program. Um, one interesting uh, summary slide, I think, that both the Joint Budget Committee staff and, and our staff uses I got this one, is a pie chart that, that illustrates kind of the difference either before total program is cut by the negative factor and then after the negative factor. And so the pie chart on the left shows before it, uh, the, the overall pie is how much is spent on school funding uh, under the current formula without the negative factor. And you can see that the base funding or the base per pupil amount that's set in the, the state constitution is about 75% of school finance. And then the other factors that Senator Johnson was talking about, the cost of living, the size factor, funding for at-risk students is about the other 25%. After the negative factor is applied, and this is for uh, fiscal year 12-13, it's reducing the size or the value of those other factors besides the base per pupil funding. Uh, and that's because the base per pupil amount is set by the Constitution, so it can't be changed. Um, so we're highlighting here that it's the overall value of the, the, the other factors in school finance, the size, cost of living, at risk, that is reduced from about 25% to a much small, smaller fraction in uh, this year. On this very last year, you can see the negative factor is now over a billion dollars. And that's been increasing the last uh, three years. So that's, that's currently where we're at. Uh, in the upcoming budget year, fiscal year 13, 14, the legislature is going to have to decide where that negative factor will be and how much can the state uh, afford. Uh, the governor came out with his recommendation last week, um, and that's something that the legislature, when they re reconvene, in January, we'll have to decide how much can the state contribute to uh, school finance. So, so, kind of in a nutshell, that's what the negative factor is. And if you have any other questions, otherwise, I think the panel is going to talk about the any questions just for time before we bring up David and George. <coughs> You know, Mary, I think I may leave that for David to talk about that <laughs> issue. We tend to display it as it's reducing, as you said, all of the, the value of all of the other factors in school finance. But it's not clear in the statute that it comes out of any one of those factors. Sure. Um, and initially, we tried to say, well, so much, if we take it out proportionally from the cost of living and at risk and 
the size factor, but I, I think it's more accurate to say it's, it's reducing the overall value of those factors and you know how it applies in any individual district will differ depending on their contribution because some you know smaller districts the size factor is a much bigger piece of it in, in other districts it, it could be the at risk or the cost of living but the cost of living is a large dollar figure so it's going to be hit the most but uh, i guess my point is that the, these are the pieces we put in the formula account for different costs associated with different cost drivers of different districts and those are the pieces we're taking so again, we're getting, to, we're getting closer and closer to a flat funding scenario where there is no vertical, there's less and less vertical access to those resources. So the more and more extra that you need as a district, essentially the more, if you need more equalization, you're going to be cut more down. Go on. I just wanted to share the group kind of a question that's better comment. One of the things, uh, and I was, I think I was there when we were debating it, for all the negatives of the, the negative factor in some of it, the, um, we did want a factor that would give a cumulative amount so we could communicate that to our community that yes, we've been cut 16%. Now, there is a little bit that's not hard dollars because some of that is inflationary dollars uh, that were never realized. But still, to be able to track that cumulatively really helped us with our communications with our communities and so when they were talking about how we get around amendment 23 so to speak and i'm generalizing that um, that was one of the, the theories that we had behind the budget stabilization factor at that time we commend you for finding the positive and the negative factor <laughs> uh, but also the rationale that there that there's an explanation of why that that mechanism Let's bring David and George up to join the conference. Oh, excuse me, a couple of hands over here, excuse me. Todd, has, has your office made any uh, estimates about when you can no longer use this factor reduction because the base will basically be the, the, the floor? When will that occur? Um, you know, I think uh, the Joint Budget Committee staff has worked through those scenarios. Um, you know, we prepare a forecast of inflation and student enrollment growth. And I think, uh, if I recall, Carolyn Camden put something like that together for the briefing um, a year ago. And I think it was, you know, if you get up to 15, 16, or six, I think it's 15, 16, that if you were to leave total program at its current level, um, that the per pupil funding would fall below the base. If I, if I recall, I don't know, Craig, if you want to. Yeah, that, that um, is I think question. that's I think that was what she found, but that assumes that the total program number where we're at now, which is a, about 5.3 billion, if that's held constant in future legislation. Just a quick comment: when you draw the picture there, you know, all the money is uh, coming out of the factors. The cut. Because, and I think that's because of the legal requirement that you, uh, you can't cut into the base. But from a practical standpoint, uh, uh, if, if you could draw the picture differently, where some of it came out of the uh, base and some of it came out of factors, then you have a proportional cut in both areas. Because, and I think from a practical standpoint, that, that in my mind, that's what's happened. Uh, but legally, you draw the cut to the factors because of the way Amendment 23 was worded. So I, I just wanted to make that point. I think there's different ways of drawing that picture from a practical application. I just want to answer Guy's question. Guy, I did a little modeling. And if the state wasn't funding the 2.2 for 13-14, three districts would actually have to go up next year. That's Mesa, <coughs> Windsor, and Pueblo County. And then by year three, you're picking up a lot of big districts, including G11, Douglas County, Jeffco. I can't remember if Cherry Creek was in there, but by year three, if there were no increases from the state, a bunch of districts start kicking in because they hit the floor. Major policy. Yeah. 
So thanks for that. That's a helpful clarification of um, understanding the rationale of why it's coming out of the categoricals, but that's a limited time offer in that sense as it drops over time. Well, let's bring David and George up, if I, uh, uh, who will kind of explain from a district standpoint the implications and uh, what's involved in, from a policy standpoint, how to wrestle with this question. David, do you want to come? And I think the microphone should be on at the, although, uh, David, you were masquerading as Glenn, so apparently. Uh, there's been a switch of uh, participants here, so we'll try to get you a new. Uh, I gotta remember to thank Glenn for this. <laughs> so let's double check your mics are on. So, what's the question? So uh, we've heard uh, just what the uh, kind of definition of the net. It's clearly designed as a strategy on the state's part to, uh, you know, essentially save money that wasn't available in the state coffers. Uh, if you could share just a little bit about your, uh, from a district standpoint, the implications, especially and I think that last question there is, is, whether it comes out of the categoricals or out of the base rate, how are districts accommodating this and does that actually play, does that make a difference in the end uh, where those, uh, that negative factor applies? And then other thoughts that you have for what that means for the redesign of a school finance act going forward? Well, I think there's a couple of points um, to the questions Mary and Glenn uh, Guy referenced. I mean, this has been um, very challenging for a number of years. Uh, I think respectfully disagree with the uh, comment that Scott was making. I think the read was is that the state could not make um, reductions uh, to anything other than the factors, uh, that the base uh, relative to certain opinions, if I remember right, that Keith King asked for, uh, that the sense was is that the base needed to be and was the only place within the School Finance Act uh, that, that was guaranteed, a, shall we say, a full protection to the uh, provisions of Amendment 23 of growth plus the rate of inflation. So the base was where growth occurred. Uh, as a result, uh, to Glenn's comment, there was a whole lot of debate back when it was the uh, budget stabilization factor. There was a lot of conversation that was ensuing about should there be a prioritization of reduction should you start and go by size, so cost of living, and then into at risk and sort of work in a waterfall, if you will. I think the thought was uh, similar to uh, the question, if I might, the sentiment behind Mary's question is, you know, what was the basis for those factors existing uh, from the outset? And the thinking was uh, that if you made any reduction in sort of any prioritization, a waterfall, if you were, is that you were violating the premise of the School Finance Act as it was envisioned in 94 and, and uh, by its uh, predecessor, prede predecessor acts. And so that while nobody liked it, the best way to solve for it was to have Amendment 23 work, so to speak, mathematically across the entirety of the formula and then back in to say, what is the amount that's necessary? Uh, and hence uh, the stabilization factor, later the negative factor was introduced so that the total fit within uh, the amount that the budget was uh, uh, targeted for uh, from a state perspective. Um, you know, I think in addition to Glenn's right and the recollection, there was a whole lot of conversation. I can remember being in Douglas County at the time and being uh, very uh, mindful of the message uh, that would be coming out to the electorate as you're trying to have a conversation around mill levy override and uh, capital funds and how it is that those uh, that are uh, local support uh, could be, uh, shall we say, enhanced or hindered uh, by the actions of the state. Uh, and if I imagine I saw Lori here, I didn't see anybody from Aurora, but I know certainly um, we're today uh, DPS a little bit concerned about the message that the state's sending on Thursday when it releases the budget of um, uh, school finance going up for the 13-14 school year when we have folks coming to the ballot to consider bond and mill levies uh, uh, today and tomorrow uh, with the ballots uh, obviously due tomorrow. So that's been at the forefront and uh, the effect is mathematically um, you're cut to the ability uh, that, that you can and again there was a lot of discussion about should it be an absolute dollar? Should you share proportionally in, in terms of a dollar, you know, one for you, one for me? Or should it be done on a percent basis? And um, you know, I, I have to admit, uh, to my recollection, nobody at the time thought we'd be getting to a place where we're having the conversation that Guy's question begged, which is, when do you get to the place uh, where the factors are essentially vacated by the negative factor, what then? Uh, we asked um, last year for uh, Henry Sobene uh, to give us that answer. Uh, he spoke to the Colorado School Finance Project, to the best of my recollection, on two occasions, offering to share that spreadsheet. 
uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's seen it. Um, and my sense is uh, the answer as to when do you get to the bottom, it's all a function of what you assume. And I'm not trying to be flippant, but it's a, is are you assuming a 1% inflation rate or are you assuming three? Are you assuming a at-risk factor that stays static or are you assuming at-risk grows as a percent of your larger student population? Are you assuming, uh, you know, X or Y? And so that's the that's also part of the complexities about this act, right? Is because you've got to then factor in what's happening with regards to local property taxes, assessed valuations rising or increasing, such that the state contribution itself is rising or decreasing. Um, but I think uh, I, I know that uh, I and peers, if you will, uh, probably about a half dozen in this room. I've been having a friendly wager about what would happen and when. Uh, I, my sense is it would if if um, state revenues hadn't improved. So it's, I, I probably sounded really good up until last Thursday. Um, my sense is it would have happened sooner rather than later, and the reason is is because you have this um, uh, iterative process within the formula. Uh, when a district is at the bottom, they essentially shift over and go to the categorical. So when, I guess in my estimation, Todd, the piece that's missing from that is including the categorical funding that gives you about another, um, off the top of my head, 250 million of categorical that gives you room to absorb, so to speak, as a shock absorber for the last district before you're fully out. And then you've got to start growing or the state's going to have a different legal challenge because every school district's going to be um, going below the base. And at that point, if that's going to be allowed, then we have a lot of different discussions to occur. But I think what happens is when those individual school districts start going below the base, they shift to the categoricals, their categoricals then get vacated. And at that point, then the rest of us that haven't been hit now have to take on more. And so that keeps going back and forth mathematically. You're in this sort of a loop where you start to see um, districts that can't absorb any more cuts. That cut then goes back into the larger spreadsheet, which then requires the district that was just barely making it. Now they have to be cut more and it starts looping pretty quickly. And so you do start to pull in some districts of size. And once you start pulling in a Douglas County or a Creek or whomever, um, at that point, the game's over and they're just going to be flat funding. At which case, then the folks that we've heard from, like Charlie Brown, um, are going to say, and this is what we're forecasting when they say that K-12 is going to become an ever-growing percent of the state budget. The latitude to make reductions is gone. And to the sort of bookend comments from Guy and Mary, at that point, school finance is, in fact, a uniform per student amount of funding and the uh, amount of per pupil revenue is simply that which allow is required by Amendment 23, which will be growth plus 1%, excuse me, growth plus inflation. Um, obviously, the 1% lapsed some time ago. As a result, from a school district perspective, you know, we get into a lot of modeling, trying to figure out when and where that cliff is going to occur. Uh, certainly, um, you know, from Douglas County, uh, that was a lot of cuts. That's what that boiled down to. Uh, from Denver, different circumstance, much higher at-risk population much higher free and reduced lunch populations and so as a result dps has access to funds that a school district like douglas county doesn't from various title programs very philanthropic um, groups philanthropic excuse me and as a result we've been able uh, fairly successfully um, an embarrassment of riches in relative terms uh, to offset some of those reductions because of our ability to have received um, race to the top monies as well as other funds that might not be available. Simp it's not that they didn't apply, they're just simply not even available to a district like Douglas County who has a much lower um, free and reduced and, and uh, at need uh, population. You know, just to give you rough proximities, you have in DPS, just for sake of discussion, two out of three children are on a free or reduced lunch status in Douglas County, if you throw out their charters, uh, excuse me, throw out the HOPE online charter, uh, they're probably at most five out of a hundred. So you've got a tremendously different at-risk population. Uh, second language learners in, in Denver, uh, depending upon where you are in terms of CELA, um, you're going to be uh, minimally at uh, a third, uh, and in some estimations probably as high as 60%. Again, that's a tenfold increase over something like uh, Douglas County, which is just to say, you know, having been a CFO for both, you just got the, the sort of, um, you run the gauntlet of everything you possibly can do to manage. 
The effect of the um, factors right now is that the amount of uh, reduction for DPS um, rounding were 9% of the student uh, population, so as a result, we're 9% of the negative factor. So when you're at a $1.1 billion factor, Douglas, uh, Denver's over $100 million in uh, lost revenues when thought of against Amendment 23. That's against Amendment 23. That's over $1,000 per student in terms of absolute dollars from the high in 910 to now. Um, forgetting Amendment 23 and just going to our highest, at, uh, excuse me, highest per pupil funding to now, we were at $7,600 just rounding and we're at 6800 now, so we've lost $800 in purchasing uh, in, in just absolute dollars per student over the last three years. And so, you know, doing everything that every other district does is you, you stall out on um, hiring relatively, you stall out on pay increases or any measure of compensation, and you have um, effectively um, disproportionately impact districts that were the target of the formula, which is to say that there was a statewide view at the time, I'm going to say that because it's the legislation that was passed, that there was an intentional funding for districts that had um, at-risk populations. And um, off the top of my head, we're at, uh, you know, as I said, 100 million plus in reductions against Amendment 23. The at-risk, uh, excuse me, between the uh, cost of living uh, and at risk, uh, let's see, at risk, I think we would receive around $60 million um, if we had, if we were fully funded right now. So we're about 150,000, excuse me, 150% greater in terms of our cut um, than we would receive for the FRL status students. Or you might, and I, uh, for those of you in the room, I do mean F status, not FRL, because I know we don't get reduced. Um, but, you know, it's just a pain in the keister. Um, so, you know, that's why, you know, when we do have these conversations and, uh, you know, respectfully to Senator Johnston, that's why at times it, it's difficult to have the conversation about SPED and at risk and second language and, you know, the comments made before is uh, very interesting conversations, but if we're just moving dollars around in an existing school finance formula, we're still going to come up short and we need to have the revenue conversation, which is, I know, part of why we're here and looking forward very much to, to doing just that. Sure. Thanks, David. And I, I, I certainly don't understand the, the whys and the formulas as well as David does. Uh, what I hope I can do is um, um, communicate to you what this has felt like in rural Colorado. And if you, I think David alluded to it and Mary did as well, is that the, the purpose of the categoricals in the Finance Act are to a belief, um, and, and I believe that belief is founded in, in, in research, that uh, some um, groups of kids are harder to educate than others. And so to paint that picture for you, what that looks like in center, uh, um, if you were to rank all of the school districts uh, population-wise in the state of Colorado percentage that are defined at risk based on free or reduced lunch, center is the, the, the has the highest at risk population. We hover above 90%. 56% um, of our kids are English language learners. Um, we're small. Um, we have roughly 600 kids uh, each year, and we're rural and a bit remote as well. And so there, those things bring about certain challenges. And uh, um, I think the research would say that educating that group of kids might be a little bit more challenging than educating a group of kids of similar size um, who don't have the, um, the high minority concentration, the, the high um, free or reduced lunch uh, concentration, the high English language learner co uh, concentration. But what the negative factor did, and this is a lot of rural Colorado, by the way, what the negative factor did is it took a finance formula that, that kind of took that into account because it was a greater challenge and, uh, and brought it down to something that looks more like equal funding as opposed to perhaps equitable funding, although I'm sure there could be all kind of discussions about that. Now you take uh, a place like Center Colorado, and, and I was talking to Rick Walter today at lunch, and, and uh, he lives uh, close uh, to um, um, Cheyenne Mountain, which has the Broadmoor property on it. And we're speculating that the Broadmoor property is worth more than all the property in, in Miami Yoder School District, right, Rick? And I've been in houses in the state that have, that, that are worth more than all my property and center. And so um, 
we've set up a system where we've kind of equalized this uh, funding, um, really thrown out the risk factors, and now you've set up a situation where these folks who are already here, they have the capacity to go into their community and still ask for more to, to backfill any cut they had and quite frankly go beyond that. And, and I don't. Um, um, and I understand David doesn't either. Uh, um, um, I, I don't think if somehow you guys could convince uh, the Denver Public Schools community to go to the maximum in its mill levy override that you would even collect enough to, um, to take into account the, uh, um, the negative factor over the past several years. No, I mean, we had some conversations about that. We um, essentially have 75 million of capacity, um, hopefully only through tomorrow because I uh, hope, our, <laughs> hope our measure passes. But if that, uh, that 75 million of capacity against a 110, uh, or whatever the exact amount is, in reductions. And so as soon as we pass for tomorrow, uh, optimistically stated, um, you know, we're, those are dollars that are being dedicated to um, pretty explicit pieces, and pieces, by the way, some of which are not at least uh, in full funded by um, school finance. So they're early childhood education and kindergarten. So even if we got back the negative factor, so to speak, uh, it wouldn't cover areas that we consider to be of prime importance. Uh, there's not adequate dollars, um, in, in my estimation, for a number of things that, that, you know, when we start to say what's the right level of funding, uh, there's concerns uh, for safety, there's concerns for security, there's concerns for transportation, technology. Um, those are not explicitly called out within the School Finance Act, and again, having been in uh, both communities, Denver and Douglas, they're dramatically different. You think about Douglas County and transportation across 870 square miles of a district, as opposed to DPS in the context of the um, high dense concentrations of an urban environment. Very different uh, models, um, yet very critical needs. Same kind of thing in technology. Uh, Douglas County has tremendous um, schools. Schools are, are um, they're, they're beautiful, they're, they're cutting edge. But the amount of internet uh, service into a school in Douglas County, um, it's really chokes down at the school door. And the reason is, is they're not wired. Um, conversely, you come into DPS and I mean, all you got to do is every time we drive down the street, you see the streets being cut up for another lane of a different Excel or Comcast line. Uh, the challenge is, is that when um, you get to the school, do school door, um, you don't necessarily have full wiring. Um, one of the best examples I can use is my daughter's uh, attended Asbury Elementary, which is essentially at Evans and Downing. Um, that's the same school my mother-in-law attended and it just this uh, about two years ago had an elevator installed. Um, you know, Douglas County wouldn't build, uh, their schools are all post that building code requirement. They have the wiring. You just have tremendous differences. Again, part of the challenge and why we're all here is to figure out how do you do this on a statewide basis when your challenges vary um, by 25 miles of I-25. So I think I can bring this thing full circle now. When you get down to the school level, I'm sure what's happening in center is very much looks like what's happening in Denver Public Schools or any school district in the state. Um, um, when you're doing with 16% on average less uh, uh, in, in a district or in schools, um, your, your class sizes are getting higher. What does that look like in center? We uh, used to be able to support f uh, 15 kids in a kindergarten class. We're at 22 this year and all our, our class sizes have, have gone up um, through the system. What's really challenging in rural Colorado is, you know, sometimes you don't have those perfect groups of students, the cohorts going through the system. So sometimes you got to do a combination second, third, sometimes a third, fourth, sometimes you need three teachers at a, a grade level, sometimes you need two and you, you do all kinds of creative things to make that, that work. Um, we, we've all been foregoing maintenance. Um, I, Center is very fortunate in that it got a BEST grant, but uh, I've seen schools all around the state that they're choosing to, to keep staff members to serve kids, and in doing so are choosing not to paint and, and, and you know, slap nails back into the building and keep things going that way. And then, and then the last thing is the salary factor. Um, um, in the last um, five years in Center, um, our salary schedule has been frozen, except we have been able to raise the base by eliminating the former base steps. Um, and then we gave, we actually gave one step 
last year. And so people who've been working in all these places in Colorado have been doing so at the um, threat of losing their job because of the cuts, but also being asked to do more and then also you know, having having to do it for the same amount when in the meantime the health care is going up and uh, all the other things. So that, that's kind of what it looks and feels like um, in the schools themselves. Thanks, George. So, so I might, one other comment. They, quick, quick, in regards to the negative factor, one of the pieces for all our, if you will, brilliance of figuring out how to do that, we didn't take into account the concentration factors that exist within um, any particular factor. So. Um, you know, and, and, and I sort of get um, to mean this tongue in cheek, you know, from Douglas County, I wasn't necessarily concerned about the um, at risk factor. Um, I wish I would have been more concerned now that I'm in DPS. Um, but the point is, is that when you get over a certain concentration, you get additional dollars and the factor treats that um, somewhat blindly. And so a district like Denver in regards to at risk, it's cut disproportionately in that regard because it's treating that concentration it's just essentially one one for one across the top and so we're getting cut disproportionately because the weighting that's intended when you have concentration of poverty is now being um, effectively ignored by the mechanics the math of this and that's true within each of the factors and then the challenge on the district side is uh, we are one of those districts that has a pretty robust student weighted formula so to the conversation last at the capitol uh, we do utilize a student weighted formula and we do make constant we do make dollars allocated out uh, to our schools in a manner that uh, recognizes their second language status their at risk status etc and so when the funding is coming in uh, essentially uniform yet we want to honor if you will the premise of that uh, school finance act we are now having to subsidize out of our own cash flow um, students who we feel are um, deserving of disproportionately more revenue. That's a profound point. So lots of clarification I think we've heard in great detail uh, effectively how it disproportionately affects through the category because the more you re are relying upon those for your overall funding base the more you're impacted. So to a certain extent this question if one commits to the premise that the overall revenue should go up the negative factor is in some ways a simple equation to solve, just more revenue takes away this question. But this last point, David, I think you talked about maybe, and we'll take a few questions from the group is, is there anything that you ended up learning in the process of addressing the uh, negative factor that would be informative to our discussions? We've had a number of uh, points of, along each of the meetings where we were weighing the relative impact. Should that just be handled with another categorical or just move to the base? Uh, or how would we think differently about weights and things like that? You've increasingly been living with the reality of fewer and fewer dollars coming to you through the categoricals uh, and more of them essentially being in the base. Is there anything uh, from that experience that would kind of add a commentary to those previous discussions uh, that would point towards, should we consider the lessons learned from the negative factor at all when we imagine an ideal weighting uh, of uh, how to allocate the dollars? Or has this simply been just a matter of uh, learning to get by with less and uh, there's nothing from it you'd want to take forward into the future? So, so I had a unique circumstance uh, in center. Is at the time uh, we were um, suffering all these cuts, we also got the infusion of a, uh, a turnaround improvement grant. Um, what does it mean to have uh, an at-risk child, one who statistically is more likely to be reading below grade level. Um, here's what I think it means. It means that no matter what you do within the normal school calendar um, of a year, when, when stacked against any other school district in the state or school in the state, that you're not going to catch those kids up unless you provide more for them. And that more looks like more instructional time. That instructional time might be after school. That instructional time might be during summer. And um, so my belief is this, is the categorical needs to exist for an at-risk kid because it does take more resources to teach them. And that resource includes time, but it includes trained people to, to address them. And so I think there's value to the get.